when I'm talking about science, and here neuroscience in the title, I'm, I'm not only interested in the, the, the limits of science in the sense of talking in relation to parapsychology and so on, in which I am very interested, but I think in terms of the dialogue that, that I want to address, it's also to think in terms of the input of mysticism in relation to neuroscience. And of course mysticism, this is another key point, Mysticism, if you look at the definition, you'll find it's to do with the union with God or union with the, the ultimate. But for my purposes, it's also crucial to understand that in the long, extensive texts of the mystical traditions, we find innumerable insights into the nature of mind and consciousness. And the question I've been working on in my writing over many, many years is the extent to which we can interrelate the insights from the mystical traditions to our studies of the brain through neuroscience. And um, what I thought we need to do in order to get into the topic is to understand something about science. And of course, uh, the, the, the students amongst us will know that if you're going to use science, then you have to observe some object of inquiry. And now that observation, it may be a, a, a magnifying glass, but it could equally be a huge uh, scanner of the brain or whatever it might be. And of course, we're going to do something to that. It might be a, a pin, or it might be a huge, great multi-million pound atom smasher. And of course, we observe the effect. And the game of science is to observe through which we can specify in good, precise terms what happened, and we can classify the data, and through those processes we get to the point of explanation. There, in a nutshell, science. What it, when we're looking at consciousness, we've got a problem. And the problem is that we're not sure exactly what to observe. So the tradition of science in relation to consciousness observes the brain. This is a question about the physical list, the physicalist basis of science. Is that sufficient? And the problem is, so if we, uh, again, try to produce some response and we look at what's going on using observation, we're purely observing the brain. That's what most people do in the name of the science of consciousness. Now, the big problem, of course, is we're not even clear about that relationship. So I want to say that we, have a, we need a different approach. And this is the approach that I've been adopting and I think coming much more to the fore in recent years. And that is to recognize, firstly, we don't need the needle. <laughs> Secondly, we do need another approach to observation. So we need to be able to observe the brain and that might mean, like I say, scanners of one form or another, all kinds of complex machinery. But we also need to observe consciousness. And in so much of what has been done in the name of the science of consciousness, the ideas about the nature of consciousness have been lacking. And my major point is that the, the um, major insight, if you look historically at this, the major insights into the nature of consciousness come through mysticism. And it's through the, the dialogue, the relationship between mysticism and neuroscience that we can start to unpack what we mean by the term consciousness. Now, that's going to take me beyond my 10 minutes. So very briefly, one of the main points that comes out from the dialogue that I'm alluding to here is that consciousness is not a simple thing. It's not one thing. It's really not a thing in any case. It's a fundamental property of reality. Now, when you become conscious of something, so for example, let's say your eyes are closed and then you open them and there's, a, there, there's an audience in front of you, so your basal ganglia are concerned what you might say next. When you open your eyes and there's something in front of you, it seems like you see it instantaneously. You become conscious of it. Not so. There are many processes involved. And I conjure that up by talking about moments of consciousness. And as we'll see shortly, that term, the moments of consciousness, comes through the Buddhist tradition. And it's, it's a very good indicator of the approach that I'm advocating, that we can marry together 
the insights from that particular tradition about these moments of consciousness, marry that together with work in neuroscience looking at the different regions of the brain involved in those processes. Uh, another consideration is uh, put up there with dimensions of consciousness. Now, again, it's more than I can put into a couple of minutes, but uh, th the fact is that, that there are different, if you like, qualitative aspects to what we mean by consciousness. For example, many, especially those involved in meditative traditions, would say that there is a state of consciousness in which there is no content. Some would say pure consciousness. In others, to give a technical term, that's phenomenality or qualia. So the idea is that one dimension of consciousness is nothing to do with the processing about information. It's, as it were, the backdrop of consciousness itself. Another point comes in there concerned with what we call the difference between explicit and implicit processing. That is, someone can be aware of something at a subliminal level. We need to understand these divergences. And again, it's to the mystical traditions where you can discern real insights into these different dimensions. So I want to just encapsulate these points. Again, the, the, the fundamental orientation of what I'm pre presenting I can't go into the depth, but I can make the point that we need to bring these two areas together. So, relating to this point about the moments of consciousness, here's a quote um, from a commentator in the Buddhist tradition, uh, drawing from ideas centuries, century standing. This idea, there are different stages of consciousness in a simple, in this case, a visual process. First, consciousness of the kind that apprehends sensations, rises and ceases. Immediately after this, there rise and cease in order of visual consciousness. Not, not visual consciousness in the sense of really understanding what's in front of your eyes. The Buddhists are talking about a very more discreet kind of stage here. Uh, that's just seeing it. Recipient consciousness, investigating consciousness, determining consciousness. For the Buddhists, these all happen in, uh, in milliseconds. In fact, the, the classical texts say that these moments are like the uh, many, many, many thousands of these moments would happen in the, t in the course of a lightning flash. And of course, it's that very brevity that means that we can start to look at these moments or stages in relation to the ideas of neuroscience. And... Uh, uh, and, of course, these, the insight from the Buddhists are coming from very disciplined observation of the mind. And most neuroscientists don't have the richness of that kind of insight. So the, um, the, the final slide, the dimensions of consciousness, different qualitative aspects to it, um, I draw here a quote from the Kabbalistic tradition, uh, the, uh, the area of mysticism associated especially with Judaism, uh, which I made a particular study. And a major emphasis in that tradition is on the notion of unification. Now, again, it would take a lot more time than I have to explain. Here's just a representative quote. So, one, to unify, unify everything from there upwards as one, to raise the will, to bind everything in a single bond, to raise the will in awe and love higher and higher as far as the limitless essence of God and to ensure that everything adheres to each other so that all should be one bond with the infinite source. Now, a beautiful, beautiful extract. But how do we relate that to neuroscience? Well, the forefront of thinking about consciousness from a neuroscientific perspective is very much to do with the binding, which is... A, also, to use the same word, it's unification. And we know from good quality research in neuroscience that consciousness is very much connected to the integrative aspect, the integrative nature of brain function, so-called binding. The way that the neurons moving from an initial phase where not much is unified to what's called here a reverberating global neuronal workspace. Well, that's a bit of jargon, but it's... it's it's illustrative, illustrative of this um, resonance, which is at the core 
of the code that the language, that the, the sort of code language that the brain is using, that neurons are using. And just to make the final point, um, the difference between the Kabbalistic quote and contemporary neuroscience about binding and, and resonance in that sense, the difference is, of course, that the, the Kabbalistic quote takes us beyond the machine. It takes us be beyond the individual, the particular. And I say this particularly in the context of our day here, which is so effectively organised by SMN, about holistic education. And the whole is beyond the individual. And I would suggest, and again, this is a hypothesis that comes out from integrating these areas, I would suggest that the, the binding, the resonance that we see scientifically within the operation of the brain is but a small part of that larger scale resonance that is operative in the cosmos and in the divine.